morning, uh, everyone. Uh, I'm Pablo Castro. I'm part of the uh, Redness technical team. Um, most faces in the room are new to me, although I've been working in the repository environment for quite a long time now. Some of you may uh, know me from previous work for the just funded Sonics uh, work group, the scholarly output notification exchange. I am going to deliver uh, today an overview and introduction to a uh, brief one to the RevNet uh, use cases. Um, these uh, use cases are a way of presenting new repository services and are the result of uh, a, big, a gap analysis process that Andrew just mentioned, which was carried out by the RevNet team and partners along uh, last month. Uh, in order to find out what synergies there were uh, between the services or among the services that uh, are part of the Wave 1 components and what the needs might be for uh, getting repositories in, into the main picture, in, into the main post Finch picture, uh, we could say. So, uh, a couple of general considerations in the first place. This is no policy, what I will just uh, show, but it's just an overview of what, what the future uh, Redmond services may look like. Uh, it is uh, a presentation aimed to basically collecting your feedback, uh, that is the uh, IR manager community mainly. Uh, they contain, the slides contain just preliminary descriptions, they, they're coming out of the design board, that it's no policy yet. It, it is uh, still to be presented to the Rebnet Oversight Group. Uh, they link quite tightly to the survey that Andrew uh, also mentioned that, that was distributed and we're hoping to collect some feedback from it as well. And finally, uh, the different use cases I'll mention have uh, different levels of priority. Uh, and different levels of uh, technical challenge, we're also hoping to be able to collect some feedback on what these priorities might be. Um, prior to going into uh, use case number one, I would like to mention uh, a concept that underlies the whole approach the RevNet is taking to providing new repository services, namely putting together uh, general mapping or general directory for what uh, research information management systems are available at universities in the UK. Uh, that is, we know we have IRs in most universities nowadays. We know we have plenty of crises running around. We have mixed systems. Uh, Nick Shepard mentioned, uh, it is a very interesting comment, that, that this IR crease uh, dichotomy may be a false one, uh, with symplectic being in the picture, that's interesting, but we don't have a accurate, an accurate picture of what uh, infrastructure is available in, in, in a specific institution. This is quite useful for uh, ref reporting purposes, so we're aiming to collect this kind of very brief description of what systems are available uh, at different universities in order to inform aim of providing services to, to IRs. So this is uh, the RevNet use case one, uh, namely the dashboard for tracking open access mandate compliance. We have many times discussed uh, these toothless mandates we have. We don't have any way of uh, actually enforcing them. So we're planning to put together some tool for uh, tracking a level of progress, uh, specific uh, outputs uh, are along the way towards being made available open access. You can see the very preliminary uh, display of what that service might look like. So uh, ideally, all outputs should reach uh, that uh, open access availability if they are mandated to be so, but they should undergo uh, several stages uh, along the way, so uh, sorry about that. So 
the idea would be to be able to track uh, the progress. Okay. These use cases are very much based uh, on this uh, data-driven uh, information workflow, we have a description over there, and this uh, should or could potentially evolve into tracking open access payments as well, if required, so the institutional repositories might be able to easily uh, upgrade that into uh, open access payments tracking. Uh, every use case has a section down here describing what dependencies it has on uh, either previously existing infrastructure or uh, components we identified as gaps during this gap analysis process. Here, this one, for instance, will rely on Iris UK, which is part of the Y1 components. Uh, but for instance, the Rio the Rio extension guidelines and this simple serif to dumping pool mapping are still uh, pending as, as infrastructure components. And then this directory uh, I already mentioned is, is also a dependency for, for this tool to be uh, developed. Finally, let me mention we could think of uh, an institutional dashboard for tracking open access mandate compliance that would be really useful for our repository manager to be able to tell researchers, look, you have five papers which are uh, under mandate and only one of them has just been made open access, has been made available open access. Could you give us a hand in making the other four uh, available open access as well? So uh, that is the institutional dashboard then out of the aggregation, which is another, yet another dependency uh, across institutional, across repository uh, dashboard could also be uh, figured out so that a funder could potentially track the whole set of uh, outputs resulting from a given project or funding across institutions and check again uh, what uh, the level of mandate compliance, compliance is. This is use case number two. I'm going to leave this on because it seems to stop the automatic. So use case uh, number two is the deposit uptake monitor. Deposit monitor. Um, it is a way of uh, monitoring the impact of uh, mainly the broker, this uh, web one components, of automatic strategies for uh, ingesting contents into repositories. Ideally, uh, an increase in deposit rates should result from, from these automatic uh, strategies for populating repositories. Some of them are around already, such as this increase IR interoperability when, when both systems coexist, coexist in, in single institutions. This is also effective uh, doing that as well. Uh, automatic metadata transfer. The idea would be to provide a repository manager the tool for monitoring the impact of these automatic ingest strategies, that is by <coughs> designing or including uh, metadata in, in the item description that will inform on uh, whether the ingest was manual versus automatic. The dependencies of uh, this uh, use case are again on the Rio extension guidelines, metadata enhancements and on the broker, because uh, automatic depositing services should ideally provide uh, the value, automatically provide the value to this uh, metadata, which is mentioned, to be able to know whether there was a given item was automatically or manually ingested. Use case number three uh, is the Romeo Juliet API. We are all aware of extensively used the, the Sherpa Romeo API. Uh, it's mainly used by Chris systems to find out what uh, arbitrary policies are. Uh, but it could be put together as, as a result of these synergies between WebNet Wave 1 components with uh, the Juliet service as to create a, a joint uh, Romeo Juliet API that could provide information related to both publisher and funder policies in a machine readable, machine executable way. 
this would be uh, incredibly useful for uh, a tool such as uh, the repository junction broker in order to know uh, what uh, a given item uh, has as, as attached as, as a publisher policies and what the founder policy is on where that item should be delivered, uh, whether it should be an institutional repository where a, a mandate is available or a subject-based repository. So it's a way of joining uh, both policies together in a single tool. The dependencies for this one are naturally for, uh, on the uh, Sharp Romeo and Juliet services plus on the broker itself. Use case number four, this is one of the uh, most ambitious ones, is the metadata enhancements. enhancements use. Uh, this use case aims to provide the means to fill in the gaps a given IR metadata collection uh, might have, such as uh, digital object identifiers, DYs, uh, funder grant info, Andrew mentioned uh, these services on this slide, author IDs, Etc. As to ensure adoption of the Rio extension guidelines, as to ensure uh, metadata completeness, uh, in order to uh, be able to provide more information, we have uh, seen this green versus gold uh, lively discussion. We have practically seen no discussion on whether a better repository infrastructure might actually uh, bring them into the main picture. Besides uh, the, the mandates and the mandate wording, if we're able to uh, actually enhance the metadata in the repositories, they will be much better placed for delivering the services uh, funders and institutions require. So the planning for this uh, use case for this metadata enhancement suite is uh, to provide automatic, so automatic enhancement services whenever possible such as, for instance, this uh, cross-ref-driven uh, uh, procedure for collecting DOIs. Uh, sometimes, however, um, the services won't be able to be provided automatically, but will be implemented uh, locally, following guidelines delivered by the RegNet. That might be the case, for instance, for uh, open-air uh, compatibility should be carried out locally. Dependencies for this use case uh, are the Rio extension guidelines, again, of course, uh, external services, uh, for instance, Crossref, or uh, this Fundref service, which is actually also provided by, by Crossref, and aggregation. Use case number five is uh, yet another uh, one of the most ambitious ones is the DSpace IT Support Hub. Um, we are aware that ePrints-based repositories uh, have a very uh, solid support uh, service or team in, in Southampton that will, boast, that will both host uh, repositories and provide uh, add-ons for them to become, uh, say, REF compliant or to uh, acquire Chris functionality, uh, but for these base based repositories there's no such thing, there's no uh, hub where these uh, services, either hosting or uh, enhancement services, can be provided from, a, from an IT support point of view. So uh, this use case uh, figures out how to provide this service under the RapNet umbrella. It's a very, very wide service. Uh, it should be developed gradually, uh, starting with what we, what we call the low-hanging fruits, things such as uh, ensuring sort endpoints are available at repositories, as to enable them to become uh, customers or users of this uh, uh, broker, uh, automatic delivery, automatic transfer service, uh, open air compatibilities, also uh, low-hanging fruit. Then uh, what about having a crease add-on? The discussion is already out there for having crease 
functionality uh, implemented on top of uh, these base based repositories for uh, upcoming uh, version 3. So it could, it could be a very wide service and it would provide uh, large opportunities for harmonization across the repository network and also for cost efficiency. It would be a centralized hub uh, providing services sometimes uh, are otherwise outsourced. There are a set of dependencies here as well, uh, such as the broker, such as the re extension guidelines, Romeo Juliet API and uh, the Howl uh, RevNet metadata enhancement suites. So all these are services that will be provided uh, for DSpace based repository by uh, the DSpace IT support hub. And finally, these are what we call the uh, sandbox use cases, which mean developing new services. Uh, there is yet another one which is a more uh, applied use case, but this is the last sandbox use case as such, which is the aggregation or aggregation search or aggregation static use case, uh, meaning some service that will rely on uh, metadata aggregation, such as one being provided by RepUK, although uh, there are other possibilities, RepUK is, is not the only one. With the idea of establishing uh, a set of services on top of that aggregation, a, a wide variety, a wide range of, of services, aiming to serve uh, also a wide range of stakeholders. For instance, metadata validation, this re extension guidelines uh, validation could be done from from, uh, from an aggregation, from metadata aggregation. Uh, benchmarking and reporting can, can be also provided from an aggregation in terms of how uh, proficiently uh, this, um, met these metadata uh, profiles are, are implemented in repositories. This aggregation could potentially offer a uh, faceted search functionality for funders to track, uh, to, to be able to search outputs by, by uh, projects, by grants. It could provide data on uh, metadata profile implementation to infrastructure providers such as the JISC, and it could provide uh, a wide range of functionality uh, for researchers uh, as such. This use case uh, has a dependency on logically on the Rio extension guidelines on whatever aggregator is chosen as, as a basis, whether it's Rev UK, whether it's Core, IRS, and on IRS UK for uh, reporting services. Incidentally, let me just mention, uh, there is an assumption we do on, on using IRS UK as a reporting tool for knowing whether a given item in a repository has a full text document attached to it that uh, follows the, the following rationale. If Iris UK is able to uh, identify downloads from uh, uh, a given item, that means there is a full text version attached to it. But then there is a loose connection here, meaning uh, potentially items in repositories might have attached some other documents, some other full text documents that are not the full text version. That is, what if, if, if we have a dummy file saying, for instance, this item is currently under embargo, the full text will be shortly released. That will actually be identified as downloads and it doesn't quite correspond to a full text document. So I'd like to check out with, with the IR manager view on whether this dummy file uh, strategy for, for telling users that the full text document will be shortly released is actually being used by any of you. So I used to do it when, when I was repository manager, uh, but uh, for this purpose it's not too advisable because it will mislead the results on, on, on reporting. Uh, so finally, there is a seventh use case, I didn't uh, do a slide for it, but since Andrew mentioned it, it, it is called uh, getting feedback into IRIS. So IRIS has a service for uh, reporting on, on 
Project Compliant Cross Repository usage stats uh, came out of, of Pyrus and Pyrus 2 as, as previous projects. Publishers were actually involved in those projects. Now we have Iris providing counter compliant usage data. Publishers do also have counter compliant uh, usage data, so we could actually benchmark usage, not just across repository usage, but, but also uh, including uh, publisher usage, that is uh, downloads from, from uh, publisher websites, if publishers are willing to share this data with the RedNet. That would allow us to know, actually to make the case for repositories, because uh, preliminary data by, by Iris UK, Ross will probably have a chance to mention this next, are showing that the, the levels of usage uh, from repositories are actually very high. And the comparison between publishers and repositories might, might uh, show some surprises, I would say. So final uh, slide from me. It's actually uh, a request for feedback on, on these use cases, meaning uh, if you think these are useful uh, as, as future new repository services, uh, as you see any specific uh, use case priority uh, among these, whether you see any missing strands, uh, we won't actually mention one uh, at the start, but there are some reasons uh, for it being uh, missing. And finally, whether you agree uh, that IRs may play a critical role, especially at institutional level in the post finish landscape. Thank you. So next we should take any input, comments, questions uh, for both Andrew and myself. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's fantastic. The ambition is phenomenal. <laughs> is it doable? Uh, uh, well, I hope so. I mean, it, it's really exciting stuff. Um, I, 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 aside from that, I was just wondering, have you had any interaction with, I mean, I'm a, I get I tend to get hobby horses and the Connecting Repositories project at the Open University, I think it's got some really interesting technology. I don't know if you've had as much discussion with them or if that might be relevant to some of the work that you're doing. Only around core. Sorry? Only around core, C-O-R-E, yeah. yes. Um, because, you know, I, I wasn't aware that that was part of that net or not, or is it not? It's, it's not, not officially. It was one of the, core was one of the candidate services that, we, that were considered in, back in January. And that was consciously kind of put, put on ice a little bit in, into the innovation zone. But one of the glints in our eye with aggregation is the potential of an aggregation perhaps working with a core type service to do things like full text mining, which I think would be very interesting, very useful. So, I mean, the, the, sorry, I'll, actually, that's another people stop and talk to okay. them. Please, please. Um, yeah, I was just going to ask um, you've talked about all these services built on top of all the, the, the green uh, outputs. We've had a question recently about the green gold thing and whether we're only going to end up dealing with a sort of subset of all the open access material. And do you think it's, there's a value in us creating uh, what somebody's called a green mirror, essentially, which <coughs> we also deposit copies of all the gold um, all the articles to ensure that we can do things with the material. Um, other views are that we're duplicating effort by putting another copy in our repository. What's your as an IR manager? I say the Green Mirror is a good idea. So I see we would actually like open access publishers to be on top of the broker as content providers who are automatically delivering them to the repository network. But uh, I think we should go for the original ones, with the, not the mirror, but the, the original thing. Uh, repositories are, are clearly useful for, I mean, uh, Iris is going to prove that. Fund policies and, and institutional mandates will allow and will uh, actually promote outputs to be uh, deposited. So, why should we restrict it? That's my, my perspective. Jerry, um, I think a comment related to that. But first of all, I want to say both presentations were fantastic, thoroughly 
enjoyed, enjoyed them. It looks like a real opportunity to break the barrier of getting repositories close to 100% populated by by group. We're going to get there, and then that, that would be tremendously useful for repositories, not just to make the uh, publications available, but to make crucially the the, the, the ancillary information, the, the data, and the supporting information that publishers can can make available. And, and repository managers should be aware of the importance of doing that. Because if they don't do that, and the publisher will come along and look at data journals or they'll produce supplementary journals that provide the ancillary information and yes, to pay a subscription or whatever to get those. So, uh, you know, it's a space that repository should be moving into. But on the issue of uh, getting information about publishers, I mean, already the publishers populate uh, as part of the service for uh, for MRC and for BBSRC, they put the metadata into UK PMC. Um, so we've been talking to some of the publishers elsewhere, for example, uh, saying, okay, we're, we're making these contributions towards, towards going away, how then can you make that, that metadata automatically available to the, to, to, the, to the appropriate repositories through Repository Junction Broker and through and through SOAR. So I think we'll continue to do that. Uh, but up and forth, which it may be that information doesn't, it's, it may be, hopefully the publisher will put, will put that information into the positive junction broker, but they should also do it through through Crossref as well. So yeah. one would hope at the time that the DOI is applied for, that the, that the appropriate metadata can be, can be put into, into Crossref uh, and Fundref and everything else um, will, will tie in. Right, that, that was, but, but related to Crossref is my question. Uh, it, 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 as, as I understand, it's sort of DSpace now and Ypres. Maybe, maybe I got it wrong about, about DSpace. They're certainly able to take information out of a repository junction broker. But how uh, making yourself a client for Crossref and being able to, to load the information into a repository junction broker, I don't think it's provided automatically yet by, by Ypres, certainly, uh, as far as I understand it. So, what do we need to do to make that uh, a service? Am I making sense? Because um, uh, I, I talked about this in the context of NERC, which Aye. runs an institutional repository. What I would like to do is make the any publications of the NERC repository available to, to repository junction broker for anybody else that's involved in those multi-institute papers to be able to download from repository junction broker. And I was told that e-prints e can't quite do it, and if, if, if I give them a thousand pounds, they might be able to do it. <laughs> well, <laughs> right, okay. Uh, uh, and, and there it's run into that. Right, I, I, I wasn't privy to that crucial piece of information. <laughs> I remember the, the correspondence about, uh, about Nora and Nerg. Yeah. So, so what I'm saying is that of course the junction broker seems to have a lot of the bits broken. The, the, not all the links can yet be made automatically from all of those. Um, let's see, how many, how many repositories do we have working with the problem? We've got um, MIT, just, just signed up, Cambridge. I think we've got a fair, fair spread of DSpace and Fedora and ePrints. You know, it's, it's, running up, it's, it's in the run up to become a service, so it becomes a service in March. So I, I, I think it's probably best better get back to you online, having spoken to you in the mural. With regards to cross based functionality, I mean, the way we're uh, planning to do it is on a repository basis, not, not on a broker basis, but uh, any institutional repository that out of uh, gap analysis on the metadata finds out that has not enough DOIs or not enough funder information uh, fields, we will link to Crossref uh, as, as a RevNet uh, in order to provide the service for the repository in order to uh, enhance the metadata. Okay. Last question for me, uh, open air. Um, uh, the, 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 I, I'm still, maybe somebody from Nottingham, if there's anybody can tell me whether there are any UK repositories which are compliant with it. Okay, it's still not, okay. Yeah. Um, uh, the, do you think the new open air guidance will help? Yes. That? Yeah, it will. because it's less, it's less restricted. In fact, the wording of the new open air did just release new yeah. uh, version two open air guidelines was uh, adapted to the UK reality. Yeah. Open air uh, colleagues are quite worried that there's not a single repository in the UK that is open air compliant or open air compatible as it has now been <coughs> rebranded. Uh, so this. Uh, uh, in 
specifically the funder coding within within the guidelines has, has been adapted to uh, a more national funding uh, centered situation as uh, in the UK. It's quite interesting the initial survey results that have got back in the last two or three days point to actually a very high interest in being open air compliant and I think the key is to to offer a service through RSP or, or or, and or through RepNet in order to, to make that simpler and easier and to give, give people a helping hand. Because I was well aware when I first saw the first set of guidelines and it was a nice thick document about how, how fancy doing this at all. But the new, new one I think is a lot more easier. I'm afraid, unfortunately, we'll have to bring this to a close because we're over our time now. But um, thank you very much, everybody, for your input. And I would encourage if you could return the surveys to us, as I say, I keep on saying it's gold dust. It really genuinely is really important. <coughs> or green dust. Or green dust. Yeah. Thanks very much.